Good morning, and thank you very much, particularly to Liviana and to the SRC for inviting me to, to give this, uh, this talk in this series. Uh, it's a real privilege, and uh, although I'm nervous as I always am, I'm really pleased uh, to be here. So my talk addresses social drivers, and as you see from my, um, the title, I actually think perhaps we should be calling them social enablers rather than drivers, but that will, be ha I hope, become clearer by the, the end of the talk. So my talk addresses social drivers or social enablers. And it addresses this question by asking, or addresses this issue by asking what they are and how we might intervene to change them. Are social drivers the same as social determinants? Do social drivers such as income or gender inequality <coughs> render populations and individuals vulnerable to HIV? How are social drivers related to social practices um, that place populations at risk of HIV, such as uh, concurrency or sex work. In either case, how do we intervene to reduce the risk of HIV transmission? I argue that if we understand social drivers as social determinants or distal macro structures, we run the risk of evacuating the terrain of HIV prevention and avoid the challenge of intervening effectively to reduce the risk of transmission. If, on the other hand, we understand social drivers in terms of social norms and the social practices that are enabled and regulated by them, we stand a better chance of enabling change at the level of community and in this way reduce HIV. As Schwartlander et al. in 2011 describe in their investment framework paper, we need to address critical social and program enablers for HIV prevention by mobilising and supporting communities. Effective HIV prevention depends on moving beyond a reliance on changing individual behaviours, or indeed social drivers, as separate entities. Rather, it needs to recognise that individual capacities are tied to the enabling or disabling character of social norms, practices and institutions, which are in turn understood to be transformed by community mobilisation and social movements. And that's a, the introduction to the talk, and I'll spend the rest of the talk trying to explain what I mean by all of that. So I think there are two concepts that have framed much of the HIV prevention debate, risk and vulnerability. And these in turn, I think, have become related in various ways to the term behaviour and to the term social driver or structures, respectively. In this paper, I'm going to argue that neither of these frameworks, individual risk and behaviour change, or population vulnerability and social structural change has been very productive. Both, I think, avoid notions of collectiveness of community or community and the, relation, the related notions of social norms and social practice. So first of all, I want to talk about risk. The notion of risk populations, oh sorry, I'm a bit ahead of myself. The notion of risk populations has a con is a concept um, that drove much early HIV prevention research. The idea that populations were at risk because of the behaviour of the individuals comprising these populations focused attention <laughs> on risk behaviours, unprotected sexual intercourse, the sharing of injecting equipment. It focused HIV prevention efforts on modifying the risk behaviour or, or, or the risk behaviours of individuals. Individuals were understood as neoliberal, rational agents who, we should and who should and would change or modify the behaviour if they understood the risks involved in HIV transmission and were given information about how to prevent HIV transmission as well as access to HIV prevention technologies or tools such as condoms. If they engaged in risk behaviour within this understanding of risk and individual agency, if people engaged in risk behaviour, they did so because they were uninformed or ill-informed or indeed irrational. The theories that underpin this understanding are essentially psychological models, such as those focused on self-efficacy, Bandura in 1977, or those focused on the role of attitudes and beliefs in predicting changes in behaviour, such as Fishbein and Asian, 1980, as in the theory of recent action, uh, recent action or the health belief model of Rosenstock. In these models, the rational, self-efficacious individual is centre stage, 
and behaviour change is understood as a function of an individual's attitudes, beliefs and subjective social norms. These models have an affinity with biomedicine inasmuch as the paradigms that dominate both public health and psychology tend to be individualistic. Prevention efforts have focused on the individual members of these populations to change their risky behaviours. Efforts which in large part were, uh, in, the, in a sense, brought about or carried out by experts, often in the context of the clinic and often in terms of counselling. And that's been a very dominant paradigm in HIV prevention. I think that that, that understanding or that paradigm has a number of problems. Uh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself again. How individuals act, whether they smoke, eat and exercise well, use condoms or ensure safe injecting, is of course of central concern to all, to all those uh, working in, in, in promotion of health. However, for two decades in the field of HIV, it has been argued, at least by social scientists, that the concept of behaviour is problematic. And they've argued it's problematic because, firstly, behaviour is fundamentally individualistic, and it positions, as I've just argued, individuals as rational agents of change, and it misses the point that behaviour isn't simply the end product of individualistic characteristics or individual characteristics. Behaviour is itself always social. Secondly, the term is problematic because behaviour evokes a relatively static, interchangeable, measurable act. But what might look similar, like similar actions to an outsider, for example, unprotected anal intercourse, carries a number of different meanings and can be substantively different across time, across place, occasion, and in terms of the actor, etc. So, for example, serial sorting between HIV positive partners engaging in anal intercourse is very different from their backing. And thirdly, the term behaviour is problematic because, in a sense, individuals do not engage in static, abstracted behaviours such as sexual intercourse. People don't do penis in vagina or penis in anus. Rather, as I've argued elsewhere, they engage in social practices. They make love, they have a one-night stand and so on. Social practices such as lovemaking enable individuals to act. The norms regulating making love enable action by specifying its constituents, telling one how to do it and what is expected of one. Similarly, safe sex is enabled by technological objects, by expertise, and particularly the social norms that regulate safe sexual practice. So the HIV prevention debate has typically focused in the past at least, on which technologies or tools are most likely to bring about a reduction in HIV transmission and how best to target individuals in order to get them to take up these tools, whether they be condoms or male circumcision, and to change their behaviour. Recently, notwithstanding the drop in HIV incidence in many countries around the world, voices, mainly from biomedicine, have begun to claim that HIV HIV prevention interventions, particularly behavioural change interventions, have not been very successful. There have been a couple of responses to this claim. One response has been, one response to the claim of prevention failure has been the widespread embra embrace of the promise of biomedical interventions. And I'm not going to address that here because it's being addressed by many people over the last five years. The other response, and the one that concerns me here, has been to direct attention to the social and cultural contexts of risk, which, it is argued, renders individuals and groups vulnerable to HIV transmission. Many in public health argued that it was necessary to address the social, cultural and political structures and, env and environments that render populations vulnerable by acting as barriers to the adoption of safe sexual and drug injection practices. And hence we see the turn to the social structures or the social drivers of HIV transmission in the work of Gupta et al. in 2008, the, the 2031, the 2031 Social Drivers Working Group, and the work of Judy Auerbach and others, and the focus on social, cultural and political and economic factors. So although the turn to the social, I think, is to be applauded, and applauded very loudly, 
The linkage of social drivers, I think, to vulnerability was, as I now hope to show, I think a very unfortunate one. It has led to, I think, the separation of the individual and the social, the overlooking of collective agency or practice, and the overlooking of the central role of community. And to, to, uh, to try and sh show that argument, more than a decade ago, UN AIDS acknowledged and began a program addressed a program designed to address the inadequacies, of, uh, the inadequacies of HIV prevention efforts for target risk behaviours undertaken by individuals thought to be rational autonomous agents. The 2000 UNAIDS annual report marks a watershed moment in foregrounding this problem. And I'm just going to quote from the UNAIDS annual report of 2000. What that report said was, individuals do not live and make decisions in a vacuum. After years of focusing on personal choices about lifestyle, by the early 1990s, AIDS prevention programs were, given, re were giving renewed attention to the social economic contexts of people that people's daily lives. Recognition of the factors that fuel the HIV epidemic prompted the development of new programs for reducing vulnerability in the civil, political, economic, social and cultural arenas that would work in synergy with the more traditional prevention approaches aimed at diminishing risk-taking behaviour. Now that was something UNAIDS said in, 2000, uh, in the year 2000. And in a sense, the traditional object of HIV, risk, was in fact supplemented with a new object, vulnerability. Since 2000, the concept of vulnerability has shaped some efforts to address HIV transmission. And in 2011, UNAIDS terminology guidelines uh, described vulnerability as the following, and that referred to unequal opportunities, social exclusion, unemployment or precarious employment, and other social, cultural, political and economic factors that make a person more susceptible to HIV infection and to developing AIDS. The factors underlying vulnerability may reduce the ability of individuals and communities to avoid risk and may be outside the control of individuals. And the emphasis is mine, uh, not UNAIDS. And it seems to me that this marks a clear call to extend beyond individual behaviour, but not to jettison it. It illustrates how implicitly UNAIDS ties risk behaviour to individual control, and vulnerability is something beyond individual control. So although in one sense the individual disappears, because it's beyond their control, Vulnerability is described in a way that augments a particular subject. Again, the rational individual agent of liberal and neoliberal societies is upheld as the mode of being to work towards. Thus, the criticisms of assumptions about the limits of the autonomous subject who is invoked when behaviour is the main object of research are reinterpreted and I think misinterpreted to mean if only the social and political conditions were right, we would all be in a position to have our behaviour targeted by well-designed health interventions. So I think in a curious way, we still have got caught with the individual, even though we, we are talking and making reference to the social. And I want to give what I think is a, a somewhat extreme example of this. It's in in a, a paper published recently by Errol and Blanchard in 2012, program science or implementation science, as they call it, I'm not quite sure what what those things are, provide a good, if somewhat extreme example, I think, of this misinterpretation. The approach of program science is, and I quote from the paper, the optimization of the choice of the right strategy for the right population at the appropriate time, the implementation of the right thing in the right way, and the achievement of appropriate scale and efficiency. The underlying assumption here is that if public health and health promotion experts can get it right, the individuals will act or behave in the expected manner. Furthermore, although the paper refers to the epi quote, epidemiological, economic and social political contexts, the major role that these things play, the social worlds of the individuals for whom the interventions are targeted, also disappear. They become separate structures or environments that public health and other experts need to act on and control if they are to get it right, and if they do, then populations or individual members of populations will act in the desired manner and use condoms or come forward for male circumcision and so on. 
So the embracing of vulnerability <coughs> All right. The, embrace <coughs> the embracing of vulnerability, I think, is likely to have the unintended consequence of making the individual disappear almost by definition because he or she is unable to act until the social is changed. It also ultimately, I think, makes engagement with social relations top-down or vertical as there is no understanding <coughs> in, in the, in the uh, UNAIDS work anyway, as I've seen it, that individuals as members of communities can and do act on the social. In fact, individuals create the social through their actions. It is assumed that the individual cannot act until the experts fix the social contexts. I think the, ab the, the above illustrates a particular and typically biomedical response to the perceived difficulties of addressing individuals and their behavior usually depicted as lying as at the centre of concentric circles of social, cultural and political contexts. I mean, this slide is one we've taken from a, a book on gerontology, but similar, sli uh, similar figures occur in many, many public health um, texts. And I think there's very little understanding here that the relationship between these concentric circles need interrogation. The individual in this, in this figure and the social are kept apart. The response is one that is in part animated, I think, by the fantasy of escaping the complexities of the ways in which persons and society um, are, sorry, in the ways persons are of society and of the ways in which their practices, people's practices, reproduce and transform that society. I think there's little understanding that it's individuals' actions that change society and transform the social. So turning now to social drivers, which is the main point of the, the talk. We need to keep the notion of social drivers. I'm certainly not arguing that we need to get rid of it, at least in some form, but I think we need to break the, li the link, if you like, between social drivers and vulnerability. We need to acknowledge not only that social drivers influence people's actions, but importantly, people as members of communities and networks, by their actions and interactions, produce and reproduce the social and the social drivers. It's reciprocal. So social drivers. Recently, a number of researchers, including Auerbach, Parkhurst, and Gasseris, have addressed social drivers. They define or describe social drivers as core social processes and arrangements, reflective of social and cultural norms, values, networks, structures, institutions, that operate in concert with individuals' behaviours and practices to influence HIV epidemics in particular settings. As such, social drivers are essentially coterminous with what are referred to as social determinants. And that's a quote from Auerbach et al. in 2011. I think this definition needs a little unpacking, but the t both the term influence and the term determinant appear, and although the term influence doesn't conjure up causality, the term determinant certainly does and to some degree the term driver does also. However, as Auerbach et al. make clear, social drivers are complex, fluid, non-linear and contextual and they interact dynamically with biological, psychological, behavioural and other social factors. In other words, there is no simple linear relationship between any social driver, such as poverty, and any one outcome, such as HIV prevalence. Social drivers are situated in specific local cultures and communities, and so as research is demonstrating, social drivers drive different outcomes depending on, how on those specific local contexts. To illustrate the fluidity contingency of social drivers, let me, let me take two examples, gender and poverty. Gender prescribes and proscribes certain behaviours for men and women, and there are differences in terms of access to resources, differences that typically benefit men. As Gibbs et al. Impress, in press note, while in some African countries such gender inequality is correlated with markedly higher prevalence, high HIV prevalence amongst women, there is also evidence that demonstrates that in some countries where women's sexual behaviour is strictly policed, gender inequality does not translate into greater HIV incidence, and indeed women are safer. Similarly, as Fox 
has shown, poverty has a complex relationship with HIV. The data from sub-Saharan Africa indicate that both wealthier countries and wealthier individuals are more likely to be, uh, have a higher prevalence of HIV, or countries are likely to have a higher prevalence of HIV and individual, wealthier individuals are more likely to be HIV positive. Fox hypothesizes that relative poverty having, to do, having more to do with income distribution or economic inequality rather than absolute poverty is correlated with high rates of HIV infection. And she speculates that perhaps it is not poverty but development with the concomitant aspirations for social mobility and demand for consumer goods that is the underlying driver. This is in fact not a new idea and one that Wilkinson and Pickett in their I think very interesting book, The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better, illustrate beautifully with regard to health in general how inequality is the problem, not poverty or not gender, it's inequality. Michael Marmot, um, a public health epidemi epidemiologist in the UK, takes this notion of inequality much further and talks, I think, in a very interesting way about control. Inequality, he says, leads to lack of control and it is this, he argues, that drives ill health. <coughs> so, to continue on talking about social drivers, the term social drivers refers to a number of different sorts of drivers. The AIDS 2031 Social Drivers Working Group, Auerbach and uh, Vincent and Liz Kelly in 2010 and Parkhurst in Press refer to a range of social drivers. They refer to distal drivers or macro factors such as social and macroeconomic opportunities, cultural institutions and related values, legal rights and regulations. And they also refer to more proximate or what they call micro factors such as policies and social norms that regulate gender, sexual partnering, monogamy, polygamy, sexual practice, drug use, as well as stigma and discrimination. While the two types are not unrelated, indeed one influences the other, it is, I think, important to think about them as different from one another. Some are more upstream, the macro ones, than others, and those that are more upstream, such as the legal regulations and macroeconomic policies, are likely to be much more difficult to change, certainly in the short term, than the norms that structure the social life or structure life at the community level. Schwartlander et al. in uh, 2011 also distinguish the macro from the micro in their development of the investment framework approach and suggest that it may be more productive to understand the macro distal factors as be belonging to the development sector mm -hmm. and to work towards de developing synergies with that sector rather than attempting to bring about change directly. Although the more proximate social drivers are also in a sense difficult to pin down because as noted above, their impact is likely to be contingent and not predictable, they are easier to address directly through community interventions. These more proximate or micro social drivers, Shortlander et al refer to as social enablers, which they say make environments conducive for rational HIV AIDS responses. Now, while I agree with Shortlander et al, we need to acknowledge the close and reciprocal relationship between the macro and the micro. Gibbs et al, in press in a recent paper, provided a timely reminder. And after he reviewed much of the literature on interventions to modify gender inequality and alleviate li livelihood insecurity among women, uh, these authors concluded that the very different outcomes of the interventions, including microfinance, support for gender participation in school, for women and girls, and gender empowerment, may be different because the interventions are not upstream enough. In other words, you're getting all these different outcomes because we're working too closely at the proximate level. Now, I'm not sure he's right about that or they're right about that, but I'm going to return to this issue at the end of the paper. But, but now turn to how, intervention, how interventions, uh, how we might engage to modify social drivers and how that might best work. And I'm going to focus on the proximate or the micro social drivers, the social and cultural norms and practices that they regulate. So I think the way forward is not new, but in all the talk of vulnerability or social determinants, and social barriers, it's become difficult to articulate, I think, in terms of HIV prevention. 
And I think the way forward lies in understanding communities and their central active role in change. I think it lies in understanding that not only do social drivers produce different outcomes in different situations and contexts, but the social drivers or structural factors emerge from ongoing social processes residing in both informal social arrangements and the everyday unfolding of social practice as well as in more institutional forms. In other words, social drivers, at least at the, form, at the level of norms, take shape and emerge in communities. What the focus on vulnerability, I think, has done is deflect attention away from communities in a way that has led many in public health to throw the baby out with the bathwater. As pointed out, as I said earlier, individuals have been occluded and the notion of agency obliterated, I think, when, when you start talking about vulnerability. The fact that community members in their actions and interactions not only reproduce norms but also modify and transform them, transform them appears to have been forgotten by many working in public health. And with reference to contemporary theorists such as Bourdieu and to the work of Crosley and to Vincent and Miss Kelly, and they point out that, to quote, social structures do not have a reality outside the ongoing flow of social life as something over and above it. Emerging regularities between, uh, become, sorry, emerging regularities become sedimented in social institutions, <coughs> norms and practices, and these in turn have a, a these in turn have a reciprocal influence on social life and so on. In other words, social drivers are situational and contextual, fluid and contingent because they are emergent and they emerge from people's behaviour and actions and interactions. Social researchers such as Vincent and Kelly, Catherine Campbell and Auerbach and Parkhurst as well as Shortlander all note and insist on the central importance of community mobilisation and community participation in effective responses to HIV. And Catherine Campbell speaks of competence, as in competence communities, and Auerbach and Parkhurst speak of resilience. Both competence and resilience have many, I think, similar characteristics. The key meaning in both concerns enabling or enablement, a meaning contained in the term social enablers which Schwartlander et al. Uh, say, make environments conducive for rational HIV AIDS responses. Building competence depends to a large degree on facilitating programs and processes that, so that serve to buffer or ameliorate the impacts of social inequalities on people's health. That's a quote taken from Catherine Campbell. And resilience is defined by the, the social drivers working group, resilience is defined as in place when individuals are able to manage the risks that are present in their environment. And as shown in the figure below, AIDS resilience or competence is the product of a dynamic interplay between, they say, individual agency and AIDS competent communities. The outer circle encompasses the elements of health enabling environments. And that's in the uh, Auerbach, oh, it's in the driver's paper. <coughs> so the figure shows, I think, the way forward. And although I have, as I'm going to explain, some problems with, with, with parts of the figure, I think uh, it's a, a really good step forward. So I'm in particular concerned about the reference to individual agency. And in the diagram, the inclusion, however, in the diagram, I think the inclusion of community is key. Uh, in particular, uh, the notion of, of competent communities and building community capacity. Effective HIV prevention programs build knowledge and basic skills, reflect community views and understandings and build a sense of community <coughs> ownership, emphasise community strengths and resources, provide so safe social spaces that enable and encourage collective dialogue and critical thinking, and mobilise existing formal and informal networks as well as building links with actors and agencies outside. In the investment framework, again of Shortlander, community mobilisation is also central. And to quote from Shortlander et al, community mobilisation is essential for an effective AIDS response. Communities play a number of roles. They connect and engage people who have similar issues and concerns. 
They support activities that target people already involved in care, in harm reduction, in drug treatment services, and already using sexual and reproductive health services. And their objectives include advocacy, transparency, and, and accountability efforts. Effective HIV prevention programs build a sense of solidarity, common purpose, and collective responsibility to fight HIV AIDS. However, um, oh, sorry, I've missed a thing. However, um, the fight will take different paths and have different outcomes because it is the community and its members who will build in the sense of devise and to some degree implement <coughs> the, in the uh, prevention response. As Parkhurst in Press notes, defining a social drivers approach as one which builds HRE resilience implicitly implies, applies, uh, implies a normative system in which people's capacity to act to resist HIV is valued, an approach which is conceptually aligned, I think, with the capacity building approach to social development developed originally by Amartya Sen. And what Amartya Sen said was, uh, uh, sorry, what Amartya Sen said was building capacities enable people to achieve what they desire rather than imposing a single goal from outside. And I think this, this is actually very important. For example, if we think about how we build capacities and how communities might respond, if we take the example of gay men, gay men who desire to engage in activities that affirm their identity as gay, they seek intimacy and pleasure in sexual activity, gay men are unlikely to embrace abstinence or forego casual sex. But they may well take up condom use or other strategies that minimise harm. In other words, what we need to do, as Amartya Sen says, is build capacities that enable people to, to achieve what they desire rather than imposing a single goal. And it's communities who must make those, those choices. Their capacity to act, community's capacity to act, lies in their connectedness, in the case of gay men, to other gay men who think and act as they do themselves. And it is through such connectedness and community activity that norms that regulate sexual practice and in other communities drug injection practice, it's, it's those norms that they help change. So what I'm, I, I suppose just to summarise, I'm actually saying I think the social drivers approach is a very good one, but we need to build in some sense of reciprocity in the sense that social drivers influence practice, but practice in fact develops social norms. It's a two-way process and that norms, in, not in a sense, norms emerge out of social practice and interaction. And I think that's missing in some of the uh, earlier uh, works on social drivers. So, there are th so I suppose what I'm saying is that I think it's a, a great way forward, but there are a number of problems, or not, maybe not problems, but challenges, I think, that we need to think about as we move forward with the notion of social drivers. And I think there are three questions or three issues or problems or challenges. One is to do with evidence, the other with whether we talk about individual or collective agency, and the last is whether we look at the macro or the micro, or how we manage that. And I'm going to address each of these in turn. So, first of all, I'm going to take evidence for effectiveness. You know, how do we get evidence of effectiveness of if we start playing around, well, not playing around with, if we focus on social norms? What the research literature on social drivers and on the investment framework recognises and understands is that supporting communities and groups to develop protective strategies catalyses social and political change via promoting open and inclusive social norms and practices through public communication and public debate. Such prevention programs rely on social capital, building and reinforcing it. Although there is little doubt that social capital is associated with improvements in health and successful responses to HIV, there is a growing, and there is a growing consensus of the importance of engaging local communities in health production, hard evidence, sorry, in health promotion, hard evidence of the impact of critical enablers and development synergies is very limited. Where local social cultural context are well understood, however, it is, as Auerbach et al. claim, I think sociologically plausible on the basis of social theories to hypothesise links between social drivers and the likely outcomes of HIV prevention interventions or programs. And again, as Vincent and Miss Kelly list 
I mean, they list a number of HIV prevention successes that they argue can be attributed, at least in a sense of sociological plausibility, to addressing social drivers, such as supportive state policies, the promotion of dialogue on social norms, um, concerning gender and sexuality, and the involvement and support of affected groups. And the successes that Vincent and Miss Kelly uh, refer to are three. They refer to the Australian national response with regard to homosexually active men, the Nicaraguan response directed to changing gender inequality, and the Thailand and Dominican responses with regard to sex workers. And Vincent and Miss Kelly claim at least those three examples are all examples of evidence to show the relationship between changing social drivers and effective <coughs> HIV prevention responses. And I think, although less clear-cut, there was also evidence suggesting the importance, certainly the importance of civil society in the response from Uganda, uh, work by Lobier and Stoneburner and Thornton, and possibly also recent, more recent work um, showing that similar relationship in Zimbabwe and in South Africa, um, although, as I said, it's less clear. But it is clear from the above, plausible evidence and accounts of social change and social transformation, sorry, it is clear from the above, plausible evidence and accounts of social change and social transformation, uh, it's, and that it is inappropriate, I think, and I would say absurd, and I do not think it's too strong a term, to insist on experimental evidence to demonstrate effectiveness. I think we actually have to drop the bar about what we accept as evidence uh, in terms of effectiveness when we're talking about social uh, changing, social transformation and social change. Randomised control trials or experiments cannot cope to capture such emergent, fluid, contingent and typically long-term change, which by its very nature is unpredictable. And I think we've spent a lot of money in a very wasteful way trying to, to, to show, using RCTs, uh, that we've managed to achieve social change. In fact, what we usually show, according to Nancy Padian, I think correctly, is none of those interventions work, and yet we're seeing a downturn in incidence. So there's something we have to think about there very carefully. So that's the first challenge. What do we do about evidence? How do we, how do we convince the donors that we don't need RCTs to show effective social change? The second, the second question or challenge, I think, has got to do with the way in which agency is positioned, particularly in the Auerbach Parkhurst model. I think the social driver's approach emphasises the role of agency in HIV prevention, but I think invokes a limited notion of that agency. They, they talk about individual agency and not collaborative, uh, sorry, not collective agency. Agency, I think, is implicitly and explicitly implicitly and explicitly described as a quality of the individual who is empowered to make the right choices. And I think this is, this is a real difficulty, I think there's a real difficulty with this because agency is defined as a set of individual psychological attributes. And to quote from the 2031 <laughs> Social Drivers Working Group, they say a conceptualization of individual agency relevant, relevant to this discussion would emphasize high levels of self-confidence, perceived self-efficacy, and some sense of freedom and choice over one's personal well-being and welfare. Um, and I think this starting point from, from Auerbach and the others in the working group make it difficult to lucidly conceive that agency, that uh, uh, conceive of an agency that arises out of connections between people. Between, I think, remains a void in, in uh, their model. While there is a careful contextualizing throughout the discussion, their discussion of individual agency, for countering naive assumptions about HIV prevention being a matter of inserting the right information into multiple individual heads, it masks, I think, the absence of any notion of collective agency, even though in this social driver's account, individual agency doesn't stand alone, um, but is um, put alongside, again, going back to their figure, alongside notions of AIDS-competent communities. But I think there is a problem with the notion of individual agency. In the space of overlap between individual agency and AIDS competent communities in the figure, um, I think it depicts the heart of HIV prevention. AIDS resilience understood as the product of a dynamic interplay between individual agency and AIDS communities. I think the problem here is that AIDS competent communities are conceived as the sum of a total of AIDS resilient individuals living in a common geographic area or sharing a common set of activities or identities. 
And as communities are made up of individuals and endemic interplay between these individuals and so on, and it is these individuals that are thought to produce AIDS resilience. And I think in that the absence of any notion of collective agency, we find a circular logic of looping from individual to individual and communities being conceived only as a group of individuals offering little purchase into the extra individual elements of community or social relations. And I think we need to think more about what goes on between people, what I've referred to sometimes as the glue between people. The result is that because agency is conflated with individuals exercising the right choice, HIV prevention risks becoming focused on and towards creating again neoliberal actors rather than harnessing and shaping social practices. I think collective agency is the heart of social practice and I think social practices rather than individual behaviours are what are transformed in any successful response to HIV. In other words, we have to transform marriage or monogamy or polygamy or currency, uh, concurrency or sex work. We don't transform some abstract notion of uh, intercourse. What we transform if our, if our prevention is going to be successful is practice. And the last, the last uh, challenge I want to take up is the proximate or the distal social driver. In this talk I focused on the proximate drivers and I haven't really talked a great deal about distal drivers. And this focus that I've taken is in part because attempts to alter distal drivers are few and more importantly, because the links between these distal drivers, such as economic inequality and HIV incidence, are by definition distant and very hard to show. However, I'm, I'm going back to Gibbs here. Gibbs expresses concern that some interventions are not upstream enough. And with reference to livelihood strengthening in conjunction with gender transformation, Gibbs and his co-authors raise questions about the links between economic constraints on men and women and the wider processes, and to quote him, of global change, capitalism and state policies. And he argues that current interventions do nothing to challenge these wider issues. While such challenges are enormous, the authors refer to their Creating Futures work, which se seeks to get young people to critically think about how forms of capital and institutions shape livelihood strategies and to think about changing them. But that is, you know, very challenging. We're talking about changing um, institutions such as capitalism. A less ambitious but nevertheless related response to this question is Schwartlander et al.'s suggestion, namely that HIV prevention programs be aligned to development goals. I would, however, add, in line with Gibbs et al., that we, are, we, as members of civil society and communities, need to advocate to bring about change in these larger institutional forms and maybe not just synergistically link ourselves to them or link our programs to them, but in fact attempt to change them, as Gibbs et al. argue. It is, for example, advocacy that changed legal regulations and led to, for example, the decriminalising of homosexuality, the ensuring safe access to sterile needles and syringes, and the outlawing of discrimination in healthcare settings and the workplace. And that came about because of advocacy, not because we, we uh, didn't act. It is also clear that cha such changes enable people and communities and their members to respond uh, effectively to the threat of AIDS. And I'm again reminded here of Michael Marmot's reference to control. And it seems to me we need to work at both the level of community and the level of social structures, but we need to to remember that we produce these structures ourselves over time. And finally, in conclusion, I think we need, the turn I think to social drivers is to be very welcomed, but we need to get rid of the notion of vulnerability and the way in which it completely obscures, I think, the role of community and undermines the notion of agency, but particularly collective agency. I'm not suggesting that populations aren't vulnerable, but I think we need to be very careful about how we use that term because I think it undermines uh, collective action. We need to concentrate on the more proximate social drivers and focus on social and cultural norms and the social practices that ne these norms enable and regulate. And finally, I think we should work to build community capacity in the sense that Parkhurst and Sen suggest and ensure that community talk, interact, and act in a very public way. Effective HIV prevention programs, I think, need to build a sense of solidarity, common purpose, and collective responsibility to fight HIV and AIDS, and sometimes that fighting is, a, is at a, a social structural level, often, in fact. 
HIV prevention must remain in the hands of communities because it is they who will ultimately decide which harm minimisation strategies they will use. Thank you.